Sam, I think your beard's just fine. <laughs> so today's reading is the last few verses from the book of Jude, uh, verses 17 to 24. Actually, sorry, 17 to 25. Okay. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who's, who cause division, worldly people, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present, your bla to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Deborah. Good morning, church. Um, this is the, the last sermon we'll have from Jude, and um, I think I put the wrong... Um, verses up, but I'll just, we'll just be looking at verses 20 and, and onwards uh, this morning. But as we do that, let's just pray as we come to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we come now as your church uh, to stand before you, uh, to hear from you, and I pray that you would build us up in the most holy faith that we all treasure and love so much. <clears throat> Lord, prepare us now to con contend for the faith we love, to contend for our Savior Jesus. Lord, please do in this time, bring to mind people in our life who may be doubt or unsure, people who may have gone astray, uh, people who uh, have turned away, Lord God, from you and from these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, what comes to mind when you hear the word contend? Uh, as I was praying that we'd be equipped to contend, uh, what did you think? Often in our minds, we understand it uh, as quite an ugly thing to do, maybe a, a diatribe against a theological error or actions uh, against kind of an opponent. Uh, we think contending is often marked by a tone of defiance uh, with raised voices, with tension, uh, underlying aggression, uh, perhaps even pride at being right or pride in winning uh, the argument. Uh, this type of contending, though, uh, quickly becomes self-defeating. Uh, it has little or no effect on those who are in error, who you're trying to convince, uh, and maybe even for, uh, fortifies them more against you and against what you believe, uh, as they can see perhaps some ungodliness uh, in you. And then on top of that, it scares away other Orthodox Christians who kind of don't want to be associated with uh, aggression uh, and unloving speech. Uh, this type of contending is perhaps best illustrated uh, by politicians and how they kind of go after one another, uh, searching out flaws and failures and mistakes they've made in the past. And then the campaign becomes as much about how terrible the other side is uh, rather than, uh, I guess, your policies or the positive vision that you have uh, for the nation. And so we don't enjoy that. And so lots of us really don't enjoy politics or want to follow p politics because of that kind of attitude and the way that they, uh, politicians can often go at one another. And so it would be really sad if lots of people also looked at the church and thought, oh, I don't really want, I'm not really interested in the church because of the way that they go at each other. Uh, it would be sad for people to kind of be turned away by an ungodly, uh, unhelpful contending one that's kind of ugly and proud or off-putting. But um, what Jude presents to us here is a very full picture of what contending is to be, and I think it's much more inviting and warm and effective 
than how we normally think of it or might have seen it practiced. So I hope we can really learn and kind of change our attitude and thoughts uh, towards how we stand for our faith. So God wants to do that this morning. <laughs> um, throughout the rest of the letter, we've also seen, uh, we've already seen the urgency and the importance of this task of contending for the faith. We've seen the seriousness of the situation when theological error or sinfulness creeps into the church, creeps into people's life. Uh, there is judgment. Uh, and death uh, on the cards. So we do need to take action. And what Jude has to say here is really an uh, intensely positive view of contending, uh, and it will correct well, the, the picture we might have of uh, contending. It's very uplifting and encouraging. It's not mudslinging. Uh, it's really a beautiful response from the church. So first, let's get into it. First, uh, when contending, we look inside the church. When contending, we first look inside the church. That's verses 20 to 21. I read those for us. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, watching for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Uh, there's four commandments here, uh, quick fire commands. We've actually really, in this whole letter, only been given one other command, I think, which is to remember. But now, as we come to the end of the letter, there's a lot of commands. A lot of, I guess you'd think of them of commitments that we could make as we contend for the faith, as we live our Christian life. These are some commitments that we could make before we're contending and while we're contending as a church. Um, and really, you look at these first four, and we see first you must secure your church before you even think about moving uh, uh, outwards or looking at others. Uh, these verses are perhaps the like, flight safety equivalent uh, of the oxygen mask. Uh, what do you do when the oxygen mask falls down? First you put yours on before you go and help anyone else. Judah's saying, hey, put your oxygen mask on. Make sure your church is doing well and being built up. If you imagine there's a storm going outside uh, all around the church, and if your church doesn't have a roof, you're in the storm as well. So fix your church, build your church, make sure that's a priority. And Jude says, first do this uh, by keeping yourself. Uh, this is not the first command in the sentence, but it is the central command in the section to keep yourself in the love of God. Uh, and the Greek uh, grammar, uh, the other commands in, uh, have kind of fall off this one, or this one's placed as the center of gravity. Uh, or perhaps like a baby mobile with uh, little things hanging off, hanging off, keeping yourself in the love of God is the beam. It's what everything else kind of uh, falls off, that we want to keep ourselves in the love of God. Um, throughout the book, we've already been told that God will keep us, and now we're told that we need to keep ourselves as well. Uh, so both aspects are true, uh, and, not to be lean, and we're not to lean too heavily on either side, that God's going to keep me and I don't have to do anything, or that I have to do everything and God's not going to do anything. Uh, as we go through spiritual battles, as we contend for our faith, we may need to make a conscious effort to remember and keep ourselves in the love of God, in the love he has shown to us. We need a present experience of all that God has done to us, remembering who he is, remembering what he has done for us. Keep yourself in a place where you know and enjoy the love of God. And when we're contending with others uh, who are wrong or who are kind of sinning blatantly, uh, how easy it is to stray out of the love of God into annoyance, judgmentalism, impatience, uh, even hatred. The gospel message we bring, of course, is at odds to that attitude. We need to stop uh, if we're at that moment, and we need to return ourselves to remember and enjoy God's love. We need to put our oxygen mask back on because we're not in a place to help others. The other way, so one way of thinking of keeping yourself in the love of God is being aware and remembering his love. The other thing is Jesus said, those who love me will keep my commandments. So we need to be people who are walking in God's love, who are obeying him, showing that we love him. And that's, of course, important if you go to someone who's sinning and doing something wrong. You need to make sure that you are walking in God's love by keeping his commands. So make a habit of keeping yourself aware and appreciative and enthralled with God's love. Make a habit of walking in obedience to him, first and foremost. Before we go looking anywhere else, we keep ourselves in the love of God. And from that place of love, second, we build each other up. 
uh, building one another, building the church up in the holy faith. Uh, We need to be continually encouraging one another uh, so that we know our faith, uh, we know what we believe, and we're more and more sure of that. What we believe and then our obedience to that faith is a paramount in our church. Uh, We need to be more faithful Bible readers and Bible studiers who understand uh, what is true and what is not, and so are able actually to correct errors. We need to be attentive to the way uh, that we live and obedience that and holding one another accountable so that we can truly walk in obedience and show others who aren't what a, a life of godliness truly looks like. We need to keep ourselves in the love of God, keep one another in the love of God. And do you see what I mean by a a very positive attitude to contending? Uh, Jude isn't focused primarily on tearing others down, but first and foremost, he wants us to be building one another up. It's easier to tear down. Uh, Everly's enjoying that at the moment. Hazel and I carefully build a Duplo tower, Duplo apartments. She comes along and one swipe, uh, it's gone with a good laugh. Uh, It's easy to knock things down. It's easy to point out wrong. But to build each other up, It takes patience and time and effort and prayer. We must contend for the faith by having a strong and robustly built church who stands for the faith and lives it out. And that's something that we do together. That's something we need one another for. To ask questions and find answers, to teach each other, to confess our sins, to pray together, building one another up in the faith. To withstand opposition, we need to know the faith. So build each other, Jude says. Uh, Next, we're to pray. We're whipping through these commands. Command number three, pray in the Spirit. Uh, Contending here, Jude says, will be marked by dependence on God for any spiritual struggle you find yourself in. By adding the Spirit, I think Jude is emphasizing the need for God's guidance as we pray, for humility, and for God to be there as we pray. It's not about us praying to win an argument. It's that God is there, and we are there before him. It's the Spirit working. It's the Spirit shaping us. It's the Spirit we need to be in action. It's us requesting his help, not not us contending, not us thinking we can do it, but dependence on God. So we need to pray. Uh, Sometimes I think among Orthodox Christians, there can be a belief that uh, to contend with someone uh, means you have the best argument, that that's what's most important. Best argument wins, most scriptural knowledge wins. And that is important, but we still must pray. That's what's most important. Or perhaps there's been times or situations in the church where you've thought the best thing to do was to outvote the other people in the church, to use the church structures to get the upper hand of those who are wrong or in sin or to outmove your opponents in church. That's how you win. That's how you build the church. That's how you keep in the love of God. But that isn't. You win and contend by the Spirit on your knees in prayer. Never go and correct someone's theology or life without praying about it and them first. Without stopping and putting yourself in the love of God and allowing him by his spirit to speak into you and to that situation. As you do that, it will change your attitude to the person you talk to, how you interact with them, how you respond if things don't go as well as you are hoping. It'll bring God there to be involved and to be at work. You'll bring God and his love into that time of contending. We pray in the spirit. And lastly, we wait. Wait for Jesus' mercy. A Jude wants us to remember that we always remember that we're not saved by our contending, but by the final bestowing of Jesus' mercy on us as he welcomes us into eternal life. Keep your mind on that. Don't forget that. Don't get lost in arguments, but keep looking up and waiting for Jesus. I take a long view of church when we do this. We take a very long view of God's church and God's plan and the faith. Uh, Despite any current experiences or 
um, moral failings or theological failings in the church, we look up and we see that Jesus is coming again to bring his mercy. Those moral failings or difficulties uh, in churches, they can really send you reeling and wondering if church will survive, if the faith is real. But just look up and remember we're waiting for Jesus. Remember Jesus is coming again to collect his church. He will bring mercy. He will bring eternal life. Have confidence that Jesus is navigating the ship. Have patience and a settled attitude that Jesus will come He will lead us to eternal life. Christ is building his church so we can wait. We can watch. In contending, we first look within. Keeping, building, praying, waiting. And as we're doing that, and once we've done that, we can then look around, look outside the church. Look at verses 22 and 23. And have mercy on those who doubt Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. I notice that what we value in the church, we will take to others. If we are fixed on mercy, if we're waiting for mercy, if we're keeping ourselves in God's love, then we will go to other people with that mercy and with that love. Show mercy to these three different groups, Jude says. First, we have the doubting. And I encourage you, as we go through these three different categories, to call to mind anyone you feel might be in that category. And perhaps to pray in the spirit that you, God would use you uh, to bring them back, to encourage them, to help them. So first, the doubting. Uh, lots of Christians have doubts, uh, particularly new Christians. Uh, can I trust the Bible? Is Christian morality and rules really good? Uh, They may see other Christian teachers or other people thinking differently, and those people seem kind and sincere in what they say. How do we know what's true? How do we know that we are right? And you can picture the situation in the church that Jude's writing to. A Christian who always believed following Jesus meant living a godly life. They always thought that. But now this new teacher comes along, begins to preach differently, hands out sermons, uh, gives out books. Uh, They are charismatic and spiritual. They seem to have a spark uh, from God that the doubter doesn't. And as they listen to the sermons, as they read, uh, they become unsure uh, if they're right. They become unsettled in their faith, pulled in two different directions, not knowing where to go. Jude says, be merciful to them by which I think he means provide relief for them. And if you go to do a mercy ministry, we generally think of that as going to provide uh, what's needed and provide relief from those who are in difficult circumstances. Here, we need to provide relief to those who are doubting and unsure. So answer their questions gently, uh, take their doubts and concerns uh, seriously, and point out the errors, but remember you are there to build them up in the faith, in a correct understanding of the faith. So we do that gently and with mercy to those who doubt. Uh, Can you think of anyone who is a doubter in your life that you can go and show mercy to? Does someone, is there someone in your life who you need to contend for and help in this way? Next, we have those who are caught in the fire, those who are caught in the fire. This group uh, has perhaps moved on from doubt or trying to decide uh, to embracing fully the errors and sins that were being taught at that time. And uh, uh, Jude pictures them as being held over the flames of judgment, about to fall into punishment, uh, what was outlined last week. They need a saving. And here we see uh, the strange spiritual battle that you and I fight. Uh, We're saving, not killing, in order to win. We are in a battle, but we're here to save people on this battlefield. Uh, You might call what's being spoken of uh, in this group kind of restorative uh, evangelism. It's not that they're non-Christians who need to hear the gospel for the first time, uh, and it's not that they're doubters who are still among you, but it's someone who once held to the truth of the faith but yet has been pulled away. You may need to go after this person, Uh, They may have begun to experience some of the fruitlessness of the new teaching that they have embraced, the new way of life that they are following. 
you may need to point out our contradictions in their belief. They need snatching. We need to go and get them. We need to contend for them. And this is perhaps the hardest group of all to go to. The Delta is still uh, interested uh, and open and asking questions, but this person who needs snatching, sometimes they don't want to be snatched. They don't want to hear. Uh, They maybe don't want to discuss it with you. It is friends or family who have walked away from the faith and embraced something else. It's a really hard group. And so we go in prayer and we go with mercy. We have many examples of uh, Christians throughout the church who have uh, wanted to go and snatch people out of the fire. Uh, One that stood out to me uh, during the week is C.T. Studd. He was a renowned um, cricketer. Uh, He left England and his cricketing career to become a missionary, and he went to China and India and Africa, all these unreached uh, groups. And this is what he said about kind of his desires uh, as a, a follower of Jesus. He said, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bells. I want to run a rescue shop within the yards of hell. That was his attitude, that he needs to go and snatch people out of the grips of hell, people hanging over the flames. That needs to be us as well. God is able to do this. God is able to save whomever he likes. And he uses us to do that. Do you know anyone caught over the fire? What they believe or the way they live will lead to judgment before God. Someone who's running off in wrong beliefs or wrong living. Can you go and snatch them from the fire? Can you go and contend for them? Then we have those who are stained. Uh, This last group, uh, it's a bit difficult to know exactly who they are. Um, The way it's talked about is a bit odd. But it's given that it's the doubters and those in the flames and then those who you need to be a bit fearful of, it's probably the uh, inner circle of those who are are teaching what is false. Uh, It's those closest to what is wrong. And wisdom and discernment are needed when engaging uh, with those who are are strongly promoting error. Uh, We don't want to get caught up ourselves and what they are teaching, become unsure ourselves. Uh, It's not easy running um, a rescue shop in the yards of hell. That's what Jude's saying here. It's not uh, easy, so be careful. Uh, Jude talks about those who are uh, about their stained garments, and the picture is that uh, because of their sinfulness uh, that's on them, when they, where they go about, they spread that sinfulness, they spread that wrongness, they spread that corruption. And so Jude says, Don't get too close. Uh, Don't touch. uh, Keep some distance. Go there, but go with fear. Go with your wits about you. Particularly if what they're teaching um, is uh, a sin that you would actually like to uh, partake in, to enjoy, be very careful that you don't get enticed in. There are... are, um, There are far too many stories of of pastors and missionaries who have been enticed into the very sin that they went to change or pull people out of. Um, The church uh, might be tempted to kind of stay well clear and right away from anyone who is uh, teaching a heresy or something that's wrong. But while wisdom is needed when you go, uh, Jude still says, go and show mercy. Do go to them. And no one is too far gone or too stained or too corrupted to be washed by the mercy of God. So we go to them and we show mercy in our actions and in our words. We tell them about the true mercy of God that we ourselves are waiting for. Do you know someone stained by sin? Cautiously go to them with mercy. So there's those who are doubting, those who are caught in the flame, and those who are stained. And we go to all of them uh, with mercy. That is who we're looking around for. That's who we're looking out for. And then finally, Jude wants us to look up. Jude wants up, us to look up in verses 24 and 25. Uh, Jude uh, ends with a, a burst of praise. I remember he said he didn't really want to write 
uh, the bulk of the letter that he, he'd rather talk about other things than common salvation, and I wonder if he wanted all of his letter perhaps to sound like this last burst of praise. But Jude, he fixes our eyes directly on God as we walk away from difficult verses of judgment and the challenge to go and contend, he uh, reminds us of the God whom we love, fixes our eyes on how wonderful he is. And he reminds us first that God will keep us, verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. A God is all too aware of our frailty and weakness of faith. Our history is full of examples of God's people wandering and struggling Uh, And as you face opposition to the faith or to church, it can be really unsettling. Uh, You can wonder if you too will falter and fail. God, Jude Jude says, look up. Uh, God will keep you. In times when you have to contend, in times of difficulty, remember God keeps you. He won't let you slip. As you do that, you're keeping yourself in the love of God. As you look up to him, you're keeping yourself as you remind yourself that God keeps you. Remember how Jude opened this letter. He said, to those who are called and loved and kept. That's the wonderful salvation we enjoy. Don't forget it, called and loved and kept. That's us. God is able to navigate us and his church through all storms of life and to give us shelter and safety. We can also get wrapped up in lots of self-confidence and pride when we're contending for the faith, or we can get discouraged or feel defeated. Uh, And so we need humility to look up to our great God and know that he's the one who keeps us. He's the one who kept us in the truth, loving him. He's the one who stopped us stumbling. We receive humility. And then we also need confidence if we're unsure. Confidence that he will carry us, that he will keep his church, that it's not all up to us. God will keep us. And next we see God will present us. It just gets more wonderful. Verse 24, again, halfway through. God is able to present you blameless before him, before the presence of his glory, with great joy. For the believer who is kept, uh, Jesus' return is a day of great joy, not a day of judgment. Uh, Jude has warned of the danger of judgment when God returns for sin and for error, But for those of faith, there is no fear. We are presented blameless with joy. We have been made pure and clean and perfect before God. This happens because of the mercy of Jesus, that he's taken away our sins, that he's forgiven us, that he's wiped away our dirtiness. The corruption that that we were tainted by, Jesus has taken away. It's not that we contended well enough before him, it's that Jesus contended for us. He keeps us, he presents us, and so we know great joy. And the word blameless there is an interesting choice. It uh, has it with it the idea that no one can bring a charge against you. You're blameless before uh, everybody. And if you're dealing with someone who's a false teacher, they might be accusing you, uh, they might be telling lies about you, they might be exaggerating your sins or kind of enlarging your weaknesses. Well, Jude says, look up to God. He's going to present you blameless. That's what you hold on to, that Jesus is going to make you perfect. So enjoy that mercy. Know great joy at his return. And finally, God will uh, thrill you, verse 25. To the only God, our Savior, Through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forevermore. Amen. What a lofty, amazing picture of God. Glory, majesty, dominion, and authority are his and his forevermore. We're left in this letter with only God before us. Only our wonderful, great, and powerful God before us. The God we need as we contend, one uh, of dominion and authority for all time. He is in control, despite a fracturing church. We're left with the God we can focus on. Uh, uh, Jude wants a complete refocus, not on strategies or on efforts, but on what this is all about, what contending is all about, the glory and majesty of God. 
the false teaching at that time had been bringing down God's glory and majesty. They'd been saying, our grace allows you to sin and not uh, acknowledging our Jesus as Lord. But the church must be immersed and focused on God, his reputation, his uh, having reverence for him, showing him glory in the way that we live and think and read the word. The goal, as we contend, isn't to discredit someone or to prove we're right. It's to get more glory for God from more people. That's the goal. That we and others might be thrilled to look up and upon God and so might honor him with our lives. What a privilege it is to contend before this God and with this God to build the church that we may glorify this God, to shout doubting or endangered people out of a misunderstanding that they may turn and glorify God. It is a good thing we can contend because when we do it well, it brings glory to God. Shall we pray? Uh, Lord, have mercy on us, your children. Uh, Keep us in your love uh, that we may not stray. Use our prayers and all our efforts to build your church, we ask. Move our hearts, Lord, that we might have mercy on those who reject your name. Lord, bring uh, assurance to those who are doubting among us, conviction to those who disbelieve. Lord, fix our eyes on your glory and your glory alone that we may contend with a right spirit. Father, we are waiting for your mercy to come and to be in your presence with great joy and your wonderful church. Lord, fill our lives, we pray, with glory and adoration for you, even as we contend for the faith. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.